The full title of my talk is The Living Arts of Ancient TV, India and the Idiot Box, 1955. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to attempt to read and do my slideshow here at the same time, which should be interesting. The amazing drama you're about to see is a matter of human record. You may believe it or not, but the real people who live this story, they believe it. They know. They took that one step beyond. Ever feel like you've met someone before? Someone who you couldn't possibly have ever met, but still. That's just what happened to Leonard Barrett of Westport, Connecticut, one time on a train in India. Episode 22 of the classic anthology series, One Step Beyond, titled The Riddle, which first aired on ABC in 1959, <coughs> opens, on <the> <coughs> excuse me, opens on the Bombay Calcutta Mail with a prosperous young American couple on a dream vacation. Actor Warren Stevens plays Len as a handsome if boorish fellow in modern leisure wear, complaining that he'd rather be on a trip to Paris, or better yet, at home in his own pool with a cold beer. He's an ugly American in India, all right, at least to begin with, but a chance encounter with an apparently harmless old peasant, played by British character actor Patrick Westwood in Brownface, <laughs> triggers an inexplicable metamorphosis in Barrett. By halfway through the short episode, Len's gone goofy and hopped off the train in the middle of nowhere, howling in Hollywood Hindi and stumbling the through the streets of some Indian village, baying for the blood of a man named Kumar. His wife Elizabeth chases along behind him beside herself, and who can blame her? All she'd wanted to do was see the Taj Mahal. When she finally does find Len, he's zonked out and flat on his back in the middle of the road. Not even the white medical missionary who lives conveniently nearby can explain quite what's happened. He doesn't do this at home, cries Liz, ever. The episode ends with her husband running off into the night and breaking into Kumar's home, only to find his terrified old nemesis waiting there with a well-oiled shotgun. We learn what's what as Len lay dying. An Indian constable, who goes by the very unlikely name Guy Singh, has the strange case cracked. It all started with a homicide way back in 1924. Guy Singh's first, and a nasty one. A wedding day quarrel between a groom named Kumar and his jilted rival that left the latter man, Runjit, dead. What's your point, asks Liz. I saw your husband's date of birth in his passport, says Guy Singh. He was born that very same day. All it had taken to turn Leonard Barrett of Westport, Connecticut into a revenant white zombie was the sight of an anonymous Indian face the unwitting transmitter of an on signal to a South Asian ghost stored somewhere deep inside the operating software of Leonard Barrett. Lenny, a thoroughly modern American guy in smart sportswear. The paranoid implication of One Step Beyond's TV riddle is this, that each and every American is potentially a host for an undead Indian with unfinished business, <laughs> for some unmodern villager hidden just beneath reincarnate suburban skin. Call that place where they meet India, or call it TV, or call it India as squeezed into and onto the cathode ray tubes and idiot boxes of a million hungry-eyed Americans, or just call it what it is, some new white hell, some other twilight zone. This talk begins with another old show, one that tried to do something new with ancient India. It's a story about international cultural exchange and aesthetic affinities real and imagined, about museums and media tie-ins and mock-up worlds, how it all happened and why, and more importantly to whom, with a spotlight on Shanta Rao, an extraordinary, if largely forgotten, figure who was once the cultural Cold War's most filmed and photographed representative of something they called the classical dance of India. Oh, Saki, how can I ever forget the days of my love and youthful experiences? Meet Ned Calmer. Ned's an expert at making home audiences feel like they're somewhere else. It's a trick he first learned during the war as a voice on Edward R. Murrow's CBS radio news team, bringing anxious home listeners hot coverage from the front. Afterwards, he transitioned into television, landing a spot on CBS's You Are There, a time-traveling educational program adapted from radio and anchored by the young Walter Cronkite, who cuts between journalists with live reports from such unlikely and anachronistic news events as the death of Socrates and the Great Chicago Fire of 1871. In that episode, Breathless correspondents report from different parts of the city as the flames spread, the story develops, and the fake news breaks. Flaming bodies jump out of buildings just behind them. Crowds panic and overwhelm the police. The journalists themselves are forced to flee at times. Watching it now, it's hard to know what's real, what we are meant to learn beyond the fact that the city burned down, that people jumped out of buildings. 
Cronkite ended each show the same way, asking rhetorically, what sort of day was it? A day like all days, filled with those events that alter and illuminate our, illuminate our times. All things are as they were then, and you were there. A bit of a newsman, a bit of an ad man, and a bit of an everyman, a guy like Ned Calmer was in high demand during American Network Television's first decade. By 1955, he was doing guest host spots on another CBS program, one called Adventure. Co-produced with the American Museum of Natural History and shot for the most part in a studio in the museum's basement, Adventure was one of several educational shows broadcast on commercial networks in the 1950s that had symbiotic tie-ins to, to New York's major museums. On May 15, 1955, Calmer hosted an episode of the show that was a televisual trip to an alternate universe at least one step beyond the Chicago Fire of 1871 titled Adventure Hinduism and billed as an introduction to the world's oldest living faith, it would also be Ned Calmer's sole opportunity to read Sanskrit poetry to bored housewives on the boob tube. The show cold opens live with a close-up of an Indian dancer, hands clasped, face turned toward camera, half kneeling on a circular floor ringed by studio darkness. As the lights rise, she's in motion, rotating her torso up through a smooth arc that reveals a thick braid of her hair bound with black and white flowers. Her eyes roll back white for a moment, as though in ecstasy, and then, as she completes the movement, stillness, prostration. CBS television reads the title over the sound of South Indian chant and someone playing the double-headed redungum drum, someone, the sound of someone keeping time with a wood block, young Indians a long way from home, broadcasting live. It was the first time any of this had been on TV, this meaning classical Indian dance and music not played for racist laughs by white men in turbans and brown face, but presented by actual Indians as something important live in front of millions. They didn't call it adventure for nothing. Looming behind the dancer is something that only looks like the doorway to a temple. Her name was Shanta Rao, an obscure figure in the history of 20th century Indian dance now, she was once among its most visible exponents, especially on international stages. Born in 1930 to a Saraswat Brahmin family from Mangalore and raised in Bombay, Rao became the first woman to study a classical dance form called Katakali at the revered institution Kerala Kalamandalam, performing her debut in that style in Trisur at the age of 10. She studied Mohiniyattam and Paratanatyam as well, the latter with the great guru Minakshi Sundaram Pillai, and made her debut in that South Indian style at the Madras Museum in 1944. As the daughter of a politically and artistically connected Brahmin family, she was well positioned to take advantage of reform movements within, within India's highly politicized dance community, one of a number of dancers from respectable families to take up the art during those years. But if she'd pushed boundaries, she'd also push buttons. Too masculine, shocked critics had sniped early on. Too much Katakali in her movement, which was much another way of saying the same thing. The curiosity about Indian, classical Indian dance at mid-century is that it was itself very much a tradition under construction at the time. A high stakes cultural artifact and archeological project of grave importance to the emergent nation. This centrality traced back to the key role that classical dance, at least as reimagined, and reinvented had played in anti-colonial cultural politics, as well as the long shadow cast by late 19th century anti-notch reform movements targeting and stig stigmatizing women dancers as prostitutes. Bharatanatyam, as perhaps the most important of these reinvented dance forms, came to assume an immense signifying power. Bharatanatyam was classical Indian dance cast at its most pure, rescued from the gutter by Brahmins and patriots and experts, redeemed from the decadent and scandalous history of the British Raj and Mughal rule, it represented no less than a modern renaissance. A speech given at the All India Music Conference in 1958 put it very simply, the resurgence of our ancient culture and desire to draw inspirations from its traditions are both a cause and effect of our political freedom. India had gained her independence through a kind of regression therapy. Her continued development as a nation required it to continue. That 1944 museum performance was a harbinger of what was to come for young Shantarao. More dances in museums, more avocations of antiquity and the future with movements of her body, more critical spectators and Philistine assholes. More world, or what passed for it, for a headstrong 14-year-old girl on the cusp of New India. First there were the tours to faraway places like Calcutta, then once further afield, beginning with China, where she traveled in 1953 as part of an Indian cultural delegation led by Nehru's brilliant sister, Vijaya Lakshmi Pandit. Rao's first appearance on the Cold War dance circuit was live at the Peking Hotel. 
It would be the first of many, although the actual dancing was only a small part of it. Too small, really. There were first the arrangements to consider, the fingerprinting and background checks by foreign governments, the bland talking points, dumb interviews, cross-cultural misunderstandings, micro and macro, the minor humiliations and annoyances of travel, not to mention the interminable posing for photographs. I've turned up literally dozens from this period, from Life Magazine to the New York Times to books about Indian dance. Shanta was, for a time, everywhere. Myra May once famously observed that a woman dancing is not a woman and she is not dancing. An Indian woman dancing on the post-war cultural exchange circuit was a high-pressure media event, an advertisement for India, a glyph of the new state, a design object and simulcast powered by sweat, ego, and tears wrapped in a respectable sari. Three years later, in 1955, Shanta Rao and her accompanist traveled to New York to participate in a series of India-related events in the city that spring, a joint effort involving the Museum of Modern Art, CBS Television, the Ford Foundation, and the Government of India. Their visit coincided with a major uptick in international cultural exchange activity more generally. That year, Eisenhower had taken away from his summit with Khrushchev in Geneva the importance of cultural exchange as a tool for advancing US econ economic and political goals remarking afterward that the subject that took most of my attention was the possibility of increased visits overseas by the citizens of one country into the territory of the other nation. Even George F. Kennan, once the architect of the US's policy of Soviet containment, had evolved into an advocate for what he described as maximum cultural exchange, going so far as to write that in a country like the United States, the quote, impact of foreign cultural values is needed just as rain is by the desert and needed for our sakes alone for our development as individuals and as a nation, lest we fall into complacency, sterility, and emotional decay, lest we lose our sense of the capabilities of the human spirit, and with it much of our sensitivity to the possible meaning and wonder of life itself. India was a special case, of course. Already heavily mined for its precious supply of export quality wonder and spirit, the newly independent nation was also an increasingly important source for another important Cold War renewable, anti-communist hysteria. The New York Times marked the occasion of Khrushchev's 1955 state visit to India with an in-depth analysis of Soviet influence there, beneath a headline describing the nation as communism's number one target in Asia. The report highlights the USSR's intensive propaganda campaign in the country, especially its assiduous promotion of cultural exchange in the performing arts. And on this front, the Times concludes, the US has fallen far behind. There should be a concerted effort to display in India the best in American art, according to its author, A.M. Rosenthal, and more Indian artists brought to perform in the United States. And so they were. A woman dancing is not a woman dancing, but a go-between, an ambassador. She can heal what ails America, she can embody a purified India, and she can signify it all live. Doing the talking alongside Shanta Rao on CBS that evening was the actual ambassador of India to the United States, a man named Ganga Vihari Lal Mehta. Mehta had arrived in the US in late 1952 during a period of diplomatic distrust between the nations. If the winds had shifted somewhat by the time he left in 58, it was no accident. In early 1955, Mehta had overseen the opening of a new joint tourism and trade office for the government of India in Midtown Manhattan, expressing his hope that new prom promotional efforts would expand Indian exports to this country, particularly in products of its arts and crafts industries, as well as boosting tourism, which had become the country's third major source of dollar income. Last year, he said, 24% of all tourists visiting India were from the United States. The opening of Meta's New York Trade and Tourism office was only the most visible outcome of a two-year push that would see similar offices open in London, Paris, Frankfurt, Melbourne, and Colombo. Among their official functions, media management and museum contacts. Officers were advised to, quote, establish and maintain continuous contacts with film and TV producers and to reach mass audiences by sponsoring articles in press, by television and radio programs, by advertisement campaigns, and through participation in exhibitions, etc. 1955 was their chance to show that this strategy could work, and where better to give the concept of whirl than in New York. In other words, what I'm describing was all a bit of an experiment. Shanta Rao on live TV nationwide, GL Mehta explaining Hinduism and reincarnation as she dances, telling Ned Calmer that the world will, quote, end in the age of Kali, a time of great evil. When asked precisely how, Mehta responds, quote, first by searing winds and fast moving drafts, and finally by devouring flames. But then, as has happened many times in the past, the world will be reborn again. Calmer asks, where does our own age fit into this scheme, Mr. Ambassador? Where do we live today? 
made to turn towards, slowly towards the visual display of four discs erected on stands just beside him. One is an inscrutable spinning blur, here he indicates, on the wheel of Kali. A kind of line was being drawn in the museum basement that day, a diagram connecting Shanta's body with the TV studio slide projection of temple architecture with the ambassador's voice and indicating finger. Classical India was new again and available to US consumers, tourists, and spectators as seen on TV. Ever feel like you've met someone before? Someone who you couldn't possibly have ever met, but still. <clears throat> and when that happens, what's the trigger? Is it something in the eyes? Some impossible recognition? For René de Harnacourt, director of the Museum of Modern Art in New York, it had happened back in Austria, in Graz, at a museum called the Ioanneum, when he saw something called primitive art. He would later describe the feeling as one of affinity, writing, the problem of understanding the affinities between works of art is not unlike that of understanding the affinities between people. All of us are familiar with the experience of meeting persons who remind us strongly of someone we have known before. It was this ethos of perceptive sympathetic affinity that had shaped exhibitions ranging from de Hardencourt's first major contribution at the museum, a landmark exhibition of Native American art he guest curated in 1941 titled Indian Art of the United States, which was the first of the museum to feature a living arts component, similar to the one that would bring Shanta Rao uh, there in 1955, to later exhibitions on the arts of the South Seas in 1946, understanding African Negro sculpture in 1952. It included, uh, I think, only one actual sculpture. And the ancient arts of the Andes in 1954, as well as the museum's 20th anniversary exhibition, 1949's Timeless Aspects of Modern Art, in which modern art objects shared theme-based gallery spaces with non-Western and non-modern art from around the world. Many of these latter carried kitsch associations in American pop culture, caveman, cannibal, headhunter, swami. To transform such objects into visual emblems for a kind of post-war American admin administered cosmopolis required strong museological medicine an alchemy that called for savvy media tie-ins, good advertising, and the latest in modern exhibition design, as well as deft curation. The MoMA of the 1940s and 50s became an affinity engine, a vitrine for grouping the disparate, the specific and the local right next to the universal, the non-modern right next to the modern, the them right next to us. Such was the situation there in the spring of 1955 when two exhibitions shared the museum. One was Edward Sykin's The Family of Man, perhaps the most famous and closely observed of all mid-century exhibitions at MoMA, in large part due to its world touring afterlife. But another exhibition ran alongside it, vying for museum traffic, and in its own way just as ambitious as Steichen's magnum opus. It was called Textiles and Ornamental Arts of India, and it's why Shantara was in New York. Built as the most extensive exhibit of Indian textiles ever held in this country, Textiles and Ornamental Arts of India was or originally conceived by Edgar Kaufman, Jr., who was best known for his involvement with the annual Good Design Prize exhibitions held by the museum in Chicago and New York between 1950 and 55, and a key force behind the museum's crossover into consumer design and domestic home furnishings. It was no accident that the Textiles and Ornamental Arts exhibition followed a similar template to the Good Design shows, juxtaposing contemporary regional Indian fabrics, wholesale inquiries welcome, alongside antique textile masterpieces borrowed from collections like the Calico Museum in Ahmedabad, as well as treasures, antique jewelry and eye-catching miscellanea, most of it on loan from the V&A Museum in London, including the enigmatic anthropophagic sound machine known as Tipu's Tiger that guarded the entrance. Adding to the exhibition's populist appeal was an innovative Living Arts of India festival, innovative and heavily promoted. There were articles in the city's major newspapers, radio ads, and brief TV performances by Shanta Rao and the great Sarod player, Ustad Ali Akbar Khan, on CBS's weekly Omnibus show. The festival itself included the debut screening of Satyajit Rai's first film, Patar Panchali, completed with the help of funds from New York and sent by plane to MoMA just in the nick of time still as yet unseen by its director. There were two public performances at the museum by Ali Akbar Khan, his first in the United States, both of them introduced by celebrity violinist Yehudi Menuhin, a, catalyt a catalytic figure who dedicated much of his life to promoting Indian classical music in the West. Behind the scenes, Khan recorded a private concert one evening in the Rockefeller's Philip C. Johnson-designed guest house. Upon its release by Angel Records later that year, 
This recording became the first commercially available long playing record of Indian classical music to reach US consumer markets. Shanta Rao performed at the museum twice, both times introduced by art historian and neo-Hindu convert Stella Kramrish, a specialist in ancient Indian architecture and sculpture who had only recently joined the Philadelphia Museum of Art as curator after nearly three decades spent teaching and doing research in India. The text of her introduction hasn't survived, but some sense of Kramrish's antiquarian take on the exhibition can be gleaned from an article she wrote for the New York Times during the show's run, linking its textiles and jewelry to the way that, quote, the Veda sees the fabric of the world as woven by the gods. Everything was Vedic. Even the stuff for sale was Vedic. Stella Kramrish says so. Textiles and ornamental arts of India was something like a civilizational reintroduction of Indian culture to US audiences, but a more American way to put it would be rebranding. Indeed, a key player behind the festival was Anne Rezer, a major patron on MoMA's Junior Arts Council, which had organized the exhibition, whose father was the president of the world's leading ad agency, J. Walter Thompson, with a large office in India, not to mention the Pan Am account, both of which came in handy. Between TV, radio, and news media, and MoMA itself, they had conjured, in short, a massive multimedia ad for India, one intended to reshape perceptions of the country, spur tourism there, and promote trade, especially in the cottage industry sector. The India on offer was one that had shed the faded scandals of colonialism. Its textiles were beautiful and available for purchase. Its dances were classical, refined, and self-contained, presentable in a modern context, promising signs from a newly independent and progressive nation with deep and noble cultural roots. It was a major effort, two years in the making, and by the end, Edgar Kaufman Jr. had had more than enough. He quit the exhibition in the museum too, leaving his unpaid post there after a blow up with Monroe Wheeler over a press release. That left designer Alexander Girard in charge. On loan from the Herman Miller offices in Columbus, where he worked doing fabric and interior design alongside Charles Ames and Aero Serenin, Girard was an eccentric standout in mid-century design, an obsessive collector of folk art and unabashed dreamer whose ideas tended more towards the theatrical than the merely functional or pragmatic. Born in the US but raised in Italy, Girard's sensibility was profoundly shaped by his lifelong immersion in a made-up world, a child's private universe he created called the Republic of Fife. It was private but not solipsistic. Like so many of the great paracosms of the late 19th and early 20th century, one thinks of the Bronte sisters Gondal, or Austin Tappan Wright's Islandia, or even M.A.R. Barker's Empire of the Petal Throne, the Republic of Fife was a shared hallucination, transacted with close family members through letters and secret languages, notebook pages filled with colorful flags, hand-drawn maps, and elaborate liveries. It was a dream made visible, a paracosm just next to ours, an alternate reality. In truth, Fife wasn't so far from India, at least the one Sandro put together for MoMA that spring. His idea was to immerse visitors in an other, uh, otherworldly setting meant to evoke and aestheticize the experience of being in an Indian crafts marketplace. As the New York Times' Betty Pepys put it in a review of the show Aim Squarely at Shoppers, glitter and guilt dazzle the eye as one enters the native Indian bazaar just installed on the first floor of the Museum of Modern Art." End quote. But few traditional markets in India ever looked like this. Brightly lit glass cases and sculptural retail displays, mannequins and mock-ups, all arranged around a long central fountain, its reflective surface draped overhead with brocades and gold and silver, and fabrics in a riot of colors that Pepys described in her review as brilliant but not necessarily bizarre. With textiles and ornamental arts of India, Girard had a chance to take a private fantasy about India and turn it into an inhabitable space, equal parts exotic commercial display and far out entertainment experience. It was also a chance to bring his close friends, Charles and Ray Ames, to, out to New York to help with the installation and document the exhibition in a film, one of their first. Charles's long conversations with the government of India's legatee on the scene, a young politically connected crafts zealot named Pupil Jayakar, had impressed her enough to help him land a highly consequential gig, a survey of the state of design in India, as well as a prescription for its future, funded by the Ford Foundation and published in 1958 as the Ames India Report. With that document, the Ames changed India's design history, and India returned the favor. As historian Anthony Achiavati writes, it was here within India's Republic of Villages that the Ameses envisioned an evolving, self-conscious modern nation 
geared towards altering behavior patterns through retraining and technological literacy, a communication-oriented society, that post-war dream of a world held together by exchanges of information. Textile and ornamental arts of India was where mid-century American design and high Nehruvian cultural diplomacy met with profound consequences for both. I dream that we are back in America on a lark, touring where most of it's already in ruins, towns with names like Nellie, Warsaw, Mount Vernon, Gnaden Hooten, Steubenville, Kilbuck, now just shells of smokestacks and rotten steeples, trashed and rewilding, parks now, some of them, some of them still crowded with squatters who look at us like foreigners. In this dream, we are foreigners, and I hate it. I rage against her decision to bring us here, her insistence. We could have gone anywhere, how we could have visited California, but instead she wanted this. Deferential cops protect us from the squatters, but when an old bastard looks me in the eye, I want to knock him out. I feel my blood boil, his flags and his fat, his phony Christ, his tin can shack without a proper door, and they got nothing on me. I'm jacked and lean, tawny and taller by a foot than any of these Americans. So when I start to throttle him, this time it's the cops come to protect him from me. <laughs> Ever feel like you're seeing something that can't possibly be real? That was Jack Macy's specialty. When the US entered the Second World War, Macy was a teenage art school student in his native Brooklyn. And that's just what the Army was looking for. Art students, set designers, interior designers and illustrators, creatives in contemporary terms. To form an elite unit of 1,100 allied soldiers, a team of deceivers bound for the European theater called the 23rd Headquarters Special Troops, or more commonly, the Ghost Army. Their mission was to baffle the enemy using sophisticated multimedia simulations. Radio operators would kick things off with signals that precisely mimicked those of whatever American unit they were impersonating, down to the idiosyncratic tapping styles of individual operators. Enemy recon planes and eyes on the ground would see an armored division of M4 tanks waiting to move, with men and planes standing by. What they were, in fact, seeing were inflatable decoys. And they could hear it, too. Half-tracks mounted with 500-pound speakers with a range of 15 miles projected multi-track recordings drawn from a library of military sound effects custom recorded and mixed from 16-inch vinyl onto wire and sent to the front. These sonic illusions proved so effective, especially at night, that the 23rd Headquarters' own soldiers reported experiencing hallucinations brought on by the sounds. By the end of the conflict, the Ghost Army had staged over 20 such battlefield deceptions, what they dubbed a traveling road show, the full details of which remain classified. For decades after the war, the very existence of the unit was a well-kept secret. Its veterans, on the other hand, went places, including Ellsworth Kelly, who's seen here, photographer Art Kane, and fashion designer Bill Blass. Artists and designers at the beginning of the war, they returned to peacetime with a better sense of what was possible to a creative American man in the information age. I learned a lot deceiving people, as Jack Macy put it, and it stood me in very good stead for the rest of my life. After graduating from Yale on the GI Bill, Macy accepted an invitation to join the US Information Service as an ex exhibitions officer, destination New Delhi. Arriving there in 1950, Macy spent his first four years in India organizing and accompanying small traveling exhibitions throughout the region. But 1955 would bring his biggest assignment yet, his grandest simulation. An international trade fair was planned for Delhi that autumn, something called the Indian Industries Fair. The Soviets and their satellites would be there in force. Macy's job was to build an American pavilion, to build it and win. By then, the USIS had become the US Information Agency, and other changes were afoot too, and with them a new sense of urgency. In 1954, Eisenhower had created the International Trade Fair Program, withholding $5 million from his emergency fund for international affairs, half of which was allocated to the Department of Commerce for official participation in international trade fairs, the remaining funds given to the USIA for trade fairs and cultural activities abroad. By year's end, the US had mounted some 35 such exhibitions and major pavilions at 15 international fairs, including the one that autumn in New Delhi. U.S. officials considered the Indian Industries Fair to be the most important trade fair in this honest mirabilis of international trade fairs for several reasons. India merited targeting by U.S. propagandists for its own sake, of course. 
the leader of the world's largest democracy, had that very same spring helped kickstart what would become the non-aligned movement at the Asian African Conference in Bandung, and had already announced plans to host Soviet leaders Nikolai Bulganin and Nikita Khrushchev on a state visit to India that fall, time to coincide with the fair in Delhi. Surely the Soviet pavilion would be an awesome affair, they reckoned, and per the mission of the ITFP, an effective American showing in a given trade fair takes on a greater degree of urgency when a major Soviet bloc competition is present or threatened." End quote. The theme assigned to U.S. exhibits officers across the world that year was Eisenhower's 1953 Adams for Peace speech. Ike's address to the UN, ostensibly calling for peaceful applications of atomic technology, had been as double-sided and menacing as his famously forced grin, as inscrutable as his famously hidden hand. Macy was given a two and a half acre site on the festival grounds, a budget of a quarter million dollars, and the talents of an experienced industrial designer specially selected for the job named John Vassos. On loan from RCA, where he established the company's first internal design office in 1933, Vassos was a perfect fit for Eisenhower-era overseas ops, having earned the rank of colonel during World War II in the OSS as the CEO of a clandestine spy school located in a suburb of Cairo. Out of uniform, Vassos was synonymous with television. For the 1939 World Fair in New York, he had designed an eye-grabbing TV cabinet in see-through Lucite, as well as RCA's first set of commercially available TV sets. Vassos's design interest extended to the cameras themselves. He designed RCA's first color TV cameras to the booms, even to the displays in which the company's latest project, products were debuted and staged. For the 1939 World's Fair, he created an integrated multimedia entertainment room called the Music Corner, as well as displays placing TV sets in modern architectural interiors. For the U.S. pavilion at the 1955 Indian Industries Fair, Vassos imported and installed a fully functioning TV studio encased in glass walls and equipped with huge 21-inch RCA monitors airing live footage and entertainment from the fair, local Indian shows and events like weddings, and American programs such as the popular children's show Kukla Fran and Ali. John Vassos was synonymous with TV, but more than that, he was synonymous with the TV set with the TV as an electronic home furnishing, with the TV as a lucite premonition of a glass-screened future. The global influence of American television didn't spread overseas through broadcast, but through displays like the ones designed by Macy and Vassos in fake living rooms and closed-circuit TV studios at international expos and trade fairs. Before the citizens of India had any American television to watch, they would have it to walk through. They would have it to stand inside of, to see themselves represented temporarily within. And according to US, official USIA reports after the affair, it worked. Vassos's US pavilion attracted, quote, millions of people jamming through the doors and turnstiles, drawn in particular to the TV studio. They stood on the sidewalk 16 or 18 or 20, uh, 20 deep to see their own people telecast, according to the report. Reprising her role in front of the TV cameras that autumn was Shanta Rao, her, for, her fourth TV appearance that year, after a stop at the BBC on her way home from London, or uh, on her way home from New York in London. Appearing for the first time before a TV lens, but certainly not the last, was Ravi Shankar. Opinion polls taken afterward ranked the US television exhibit as the fair's number one attraction. An editorial review of the fair in India's Economic Weekly, published in October of 55, remarks that of the, fair, of the fair's 21 national pavilions, the US's was most imposing of all. The average sightseer will find the numerous gadgets which contribute to the American way of life very attractive, they write. The television section may dominate the show and make even the international GEC's instructive house of science less spectacular. That a simple TV studio should have taken top honors is particularly noteworthy given the competition. For example, the US Pavilion's largest exhibit was a full-size 30-foot tall simulacrum of the X-10 Oak Ridge graphite reactor a non-radioactive mock-up, according to the Economic Weekly, whose head editors highlight this interesting word as an example of mid-century American parlance. A sound installation, meanwhile, played the amplified gurgles from a Geiger counter. Another exhibit featured the man from Mars, a mannequin in an inflated spacesuit whom visitors were encouraged to touch. Particularly popular was a magic hands display, which featured one animated me mechanical device never before seen in India, they write, which can work miracles, or near miracles anyway, make it right, pour, unravel, and tighten, 
add a beautiful woman and you've got a devastating exhibit. A team of 75 trilingual Indian guides in matching orange coveralls, mostly grad students, led groups of visitors through the 100,000 square foot single story expanse, topped with a giant model of an atom. <laughs> Nehru himself took a spin, led by Jack Macy, and so did Nikita Khrushchev. The sign above the door said, Atoms for Peace, but the pavilion inside screamed, Atomic Sex Robots in TV Land. It was like the Springfield of the Simpsons had come to Delhi, Kukla, Fran, and Kali. In 1956, Macy took the show back on the road, first to Afghanistan, where the US pavilion inhabited a, geo a geodesic dome designed by Buckminster Fuller, manufactured in North Carolina and shipped at the last minute to Kabul, its most popular exhibit was another TV studio. After Delhi, they all had them, including the Macy-designed 1959 American National Exhibition in Moscow, site of the so-called kitchen debate. It's seldom remembered that it's only called that because it ended inside a kitchen. It had started just next door in Anam's TV studio. By hook or by crook, the Cold War would be televised, mainly by crook. A real TV ending. When Vassos got back to stateside, he began assembling a top secret design team, a forward-looking brain trust that brought engineers together with architects, anthropologists, and interior designers. A report they delivered to RCA execs in 1961 provided a glimpse into a flat-screened, fully media-integrated future. MoMA, for its part, flipped the script on textiles and ornamental arts of India and the next year produced Textiles USA. It was that easy. And what about G.L. Mehta, Indian ambassador and guest star on CBS Adventure Hinduism? Mehta's six-year tenure in Washington ended in 58, but not before an unfortunate incident in Houston. While en route to Mexico City in August of 55, a few months after the filming of Adventure Hinduism, he and a colleague were refused service at an airport restaurant there, sparking an outcry and leading to newspaper headlines and leads like, Envoy is victim of segregation, Ambassador of India is mistaken for a Negro, Meta Jim Crowed in Houston. And hours later, Secretary of State John Foster Dulles issues official apology on behalf of the United States government. And what about Shanta Rao? What about the one who danced on TV from New York to De New Delhi? The one who was sent out to represent the purest art of India to an impure world? The one who danced at MoMA? Whatever happened to her? Shanta kept up her role as cultural ambassador for years, taking Kerala's venerated Kalamundalam troupe to the US and Middle East on a state-sponsored tour in 1957, for example, the first of its kind. New York Times dance critic John Martin gave them a lousy review, writing, it's a delicate task to import an alien art, import an alien art and make its values clear, and that except for the star herself, there was little to kindle, kindle the imagination. Indian dance needed careful staging and commentary in order to communicate to the Western market. Audiences, no matter how eager, needed training. It added up to a heavy lift and a tough gig, a complex burden that imposed nearly irreconcilable demands on performers like Shanta Rao. Presented as living embodiments of an unchanging tradition, they had nonetheless been forced by necessity to craft highly innovative, modern, and exportable, indeed televisual idioms for Indian dance and music. Meanwhile, relationships with government officials back home had to be managed, and life on the road came with its own forms of bureaucracy and suffering. In a report on cultural exchange prepared for MoMA, the otherwise enthusiastic George F. Kennan sounds a note of caution, deploring poor treatment of foreign artists in the US who are fingerprinted like common criminals, he says, and scrutinized for their politics, adding, we have already created a situation in which the holding of scientific and cultural gatherings in this country has been so difficult that many well-meaning people quail at the thought of initiating them. After all, cultural events are not political livestock exhibits in which we put forward human figures to be admired for the purity of their ideological features. That's a pretty fair assessment of how Shanta Rao came to feel and how she was treated too on, success, on successive tours to the US, Israel, Japan, Nepal, the UK, Germany, and elsewhere. A woman dancing is not a woman dancing, but an export item subject to controls. Famously difficult and sensitive to criticism, Rao began withdrawing from the limelight in the 1970s. By the final decades of her life, she, beca she became something of a recluse. 
A woman of private means, she lived in an apartment on Brigade Road in Bangalore, making few appearances on stage and dedicating herself to an arts center she founded there that was more like a paracosmic research station than a dance school. A combination of painting studio, listening room, performance space, and archive dedicated the development of something that she called Bama Nurchum, a novel ancient future dance form she debuted on a tour of the US in 1963 after a three-year period of intense study at a tantric temple in Andhra Pradesh. Bahama Nrityam was unclassifiable, of course, and that was the problem. Emerging norms for Indian classical dance, particularly its most visible styles, Bharatanatyam and Katak, left little room for such audacity. Musicians visited daily for dance practice, otherwise only a handful of outsiders were allowed into Shanta's private world. One was a designer named Ashok Chatterjee, who first saw her perform in Delhi in 1953. My life changed that evening, he says. Not a single day has passed without some memory of Shanta's art. A few years before her death, Shanta Rao gave Chatterjee a very unusual assignment. He was to determine if any tapes existed of her 1950s TV performances. Chatterjee spent the next three years searching, eventually locating and sending her footage of her appearance with Ustad Ali Akbar Khan on CBS's Omnibus in 1955. Her request, according to Chatterjee, related to the fact that she had developed, quote, an absolute phobia of being photographed or filmed and needed to know whether those records existed. When she died at home in Bangalore in December of 2007, she was alone with a paintbrush in her hand and the package Chatterjee sent her with the tape unopened on the floor. The 2,000-year-old temple dancer had left the building. Thank you. <laughs>